We've got conference championship game predictions and takes on takes. A loaded show coming up today for you on the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast. You are locked on NFL scouting with the Draft Dude, your daily podcast for NFL and college football scouting. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's better than this? It's guys being dudes here on the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast. We're the Draft Dudes. I'm Joe Marino from Locked On Bills. He's Kyle Krabs from Locked On Dolphins. And we are your NFL experts here with you daily to talk team building across the league on the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast with the Draft Dudes, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'd like to thank you for making Locked On NFL Scouting your first listen every day. And a big welcome and shout out. To our everydayers, those of you who make us our your first listen every single day, we appreciate y'all being here very, very much. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers can get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Happy Conference Championship Preview and Takes on Takes Friday to you and everyone checking out the show. Good to be good here. To, good to be here. Good to be here. Good to be here. Were you really going to say good to be here? Yes, 100%. Yeah, we right. said the same thing. S, mm. Yeah, it happened. Yeah. Weird. All right. Well, which uh, you start on the NFC? Is is that that's the first game, right? No, it's the, it's the AFC it's game first. first. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you have three Baltimore o'clock. hosting Kansas City at three o'clock on Sunday afternoon for a trip to the Super Bowl. Which Super Bowl is this one? 58? I don't know. I you could say anything right now and I'd believe you. I literally have no idea what number Super Bowl this is. It is Super Bowl Fifty Eight. Oh, kudos to you for knowing that. I've just seen the the red and purple Roman numerals that had everybody freaking out in November for the conspiracy theory about the <laughs> color of the Super Bowl logo and how it's lined up with the teams that have played the past few years. Yeah, the last two, right? We're potentially getting a third here. So. Yes. So if it's if it's scripted, then it's just Ravens, 49ers, we'll move on with our lives. But we'll see if I guess the Lions and, and Chiefs have something to say about that. I have a question for you. Do you know how to read Roman numerals? Yes. Like, you, you could look at them and figure it out. Oh, good yes. for you. I have no idea. No idea what like, they mean. So the, like the 10 is uh the X, right? But you can say anything. I have no idea. Anyone, yeah, no. XL. That's a t-shirt size, Kyle. I don't I don't know what that means in terms of numbers. <laughs> um so the thing about Roman numerals is you know the dash means one, and then you go up to three, and then it becomes a one with a V because the V is five, and you put the one before the V, that means you subtract it, and that means it's four. Yeah, I just I just do the regular numbers, you know. Seems yeah. crazily unnecessarily complicated. You're only saving yourself a few more pencil strokes. And the you're, the you're writing it by hand. It's just also easier to con- to consume. Everybody can see a five and a four and see that's fifty four. Blame the Romans, man. I don't know what to tell you. They We've moved work. on. We've moved on from the Romans, but somehow this is the one thing in the world where we're continuing with using their numbers. Is the yeah, Super this Bowl? Is a, this is a better hill to die on than the metric system versus us being the only ones <laughs> stateside who use feet and pounds and all that. So uh, I'm with you. I agree. All right, Chiefs and Ravens. Let's let's make some picks here. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just it, it's really hard to bet against Patrick Mahomes, but at the same time, Baltimore at home with their defense playing as well as it is, and they the fact that Baltimore has the size and ability to run the ball offensively, and they have an explosive play element to them. I just think they're the more complete team. And as I reflect on them also being at home, I'm inclined to lean into Baltimore winning this football. Yeah, I really like Baltimore's defense in this game. Um, I think in rush the passer, I think they've got they got everything they need to match up in the back seven against yeah. KC. I mean, can Mahomes make magic and and make those plays? Sure, yeah, he can. I mean, he lit up the Bills with explosive plays last week, but I think Baltimore and their collective availability in their back seven and how they played this season. I, I just kind of trust it. And Kansas city's run defense stinks. Okay. It's, it's been bad all season long and Baltimore can attack that so well and sprinkle in their passing game. 
I don't think there's a like. I hate to feel like that Mahomes is is like a true underdog, and he's going to have to really elevate, and, and certainly he can. But unless like they just lay an egg offensively, Baltimore, I think they win this game. What's the game total? I I, I it could twenty four seventeen something like that. I'll see what FanDuel has it as for the over under. Yeah. I just I I don't want to overlook Kansas City's defense, respectively, as well. They're uh, number two, obviously, in scoring in yards this season. They've been terrific, but the one thing they can't do is stop the run. It's forty four and a half points. I take the oh, what I just said, twenty four to seventeen. I mean, it's kind of what I'm seeing. I'd probably take the under, but oh, it's playoff football, right? Like, you feel like this is going to be. What was that Super Bowl with with Cincinnati and and the Rams? That was twenty to seventeen, right? Was that the final? Something like that, yeah. Like that, I could see us going that direction. Two good two kickers teams, here. Teams that can run the ball. Yep. Uh, two good defenses. Although I I think uh, Baltimore just creates more matchup problems. I agree. But the other guys got Patrick Mahomes, so. <laughs> Right. Um, I don't. I don't envy. The. I mean, the money line is is pretty firmly in favor of Baltimore. So it seems like the the um, the odds makers really like Baltimore as well. That said, I, I do think Baltimore wins. I think it'll be very close. Would not be surprised if this is a last possession type of game, and it's not particularly high score. Lamar with a great quote this week. What do you like about competing against Patrick Mahomes? I don't. I don't, I don't like competing against Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> I got a good laugh out of that. Yeah, I thought that was good. All right, I got we both picking Baltimore. Both picking Baltimore. All right. Uh, and then you have Detroit at San Francisco. San Francisco is favored by more than a touchdown at home, which is a little surprising to me. I'd agree. Um, there's a lot of dynamics in play in this game. Obviously, Detroit's run defense stands out to me. Debo Samuel's availability stands out to me. But the biggest thing that stands out to me in this matchup is Kyle Shanahan versus Dan Campbell. And, you know, even against Green Bay, Shanahan kind of fell into some of those tendencies that has taken victories away from him in the past Mm -hmm. in big moments. And if there's anything that I trust Dan Campbell to do is go for it. I think they're going to be the more aggressive team. I like their run defense. I like that they just played the Rams a couple of weeks ago. I like their ball hawks that they have in the secondary. I like their tackling on the second level. I like Detroit in this game, and especially after I saw how Green Bay ran the football against San Francisco, and now it's David Montgomery and Jameer Gibbs coming in. I think the Lions go into San Francisco and get this win because they're going to go for it. think they win. I think they win. Put me down for Detroit win. That's fun. Um, I think we've talked about this before, but there's an element of pressure that exists in this game for, I think, one side and not for the other. In that Detroit won one playoff game since the 50s. They've won two. They've won two. Well, they've won three. They've won two this year. Yeah. They've doubled their win total from the last 60 years. Yeah. In two weeks. Um, it's very easy to buy into what Detroit has going on and Dan Campbell and his his messaging to the team. I think San Francisco in a vacuum is the better team and the better teams at home. But I think you could bring up a great point with the Shanahan moments and decision making in some of those moments where he kind of outsmarts himself or overthinks some things and Detroit I mean they showed you that in Dallas at the end of the year right we're going we're gonna be aggressive we're just gonna go we're gonna do it so can do we know what Debo Samuel's status is I know it doesn't sound promising right he'll be hampered if he plays The weird thing is you look at this game through the quarterback element and Detroit probably has a leg up because Jared Goff's been here. 
there's an experience level with Goff in these stages that Brock got hurt in the NFC Championship game last year. He didn't really get a chance to play or like really play. He just hand the ball off in the second half. Yeah. I want to pick Detroit, but my gut still tells me San Francisco. I've thought about this all week long, so. Yeah, me too. I I think I'm going to pick San Francisco. There it is. I tried to talk myself into it this this last three minutes, and I couldn't get there. So I'll go San Francisco at home. We are aligned on the Ravens. I have the Lions. Kyle has the 49ers. We shall see on Sunday afternoon. Takes on takes coming up here after this. So stick with us. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Sometimes we all need the opportunity to get something off our chest. Big or small, certain things can really start to get to you, and it's important to let that out, especially to someone who's unbiased on your life. Therapy can be different for everyone. Most of us have bigger problems than our favorite sports team, and it's important to get things off our chest every once in a while. It's helpful for learning positive coping skills and how to set boundaries, and empowers you to be the best version of yourself. It's not just for people who have experienced major trauma. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule. So visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOn to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOn. The NFL playoffs are here, but there's still plenty of time to get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because right now new customers can get $150 in bonus bets. Guaranteed, when you place a $5 bet, that's $150 bucks in bonus bets, win or lose the app. Super easy to use, and there are plenty of different ways that you can bet, like a live same-game parlay. You can find bets in the Explore tab. There's a parlay hub and more. Maybe you want to get in on these conference championship games. Maybe you think Detroit's going to win just like me. You can get in on that money line, so check it out. Visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn and make your first bet a layup. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. FanDuel has some, uh, some stats for these games, the spreads. Mm-hmm. What percentage of money do you think is split on the spread for Baltimore minus three and a half versus Kansas City? I think it's probably pretty close to even on that. Uh, 51 to 49 yeah. on yeah. Baltimore. Now, that's money. What percent of bets do you think fall on either side of Baltimore minus three and a half? I think people are going to take Mahomes in the points. Uh, 51% of bets are on Mahomes and the points. Tight. Conversely, Detroit, San Francisco, Detroit underdogs by seven and a half points. What percent of money do you think falls on either side of San Francisco minus seven and a half? I think most people think that Detroit will cover that. 66%. Yeah. On Detroit to cover the spread. What percent of bets do you think are on either side? Money Uh, line bets? Yeah. No. uh, Spread. Detroit. It's got to be pretty high. 73%. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. Our little takes on takes here. Got some some good uh, team building stuff here. So let's get into that. Hill's Real Football Talk says the NFL desperately needs to change their calendar when it comes to coaching hires for the coordinators and other candidates of teams that are still alive in the playoffs, having to handle interviews is a massive distraction while simultaneously it hurts them since they can't conduct nearly the same amount of in-person interviews with teams. And it also works against the league's main principle of trying to create parity since contending teams have the benefit of their guys not being hired away. You know what the problem here is? Your league year starts officially the second week of March, which is less than two months away already. Right. Like it's like seven, eight weeks away. And in between that. You got how many all star events in the NFL combine? <laughs> yeah. Right. Like this, it's it's got to be lined up. So you don't really have time to wait. Like, what are you going to wait until the Super Bowl is done to open up the hiring window? And then everybody's got to scramble and everybody's going to be in limbo about whether they're being brought back or retained from a new coach or if they're going to go with their buddy to a different spot and just feels like the logistics of that get way messy versus three quarters to now 90% of the league is off. Yeah. Now's the time to do it, unfortunately. So hope your assistants can handle that amidst their prepping accordingly. 
Yeah, it's tough, man. Like, I don't, I don't think there's an easy answer to it, but I think this makes it worse. I mean, like, you want to talk about the parity dynamic, make a team spend the first eight weeks of their off season without a head coach and direction of where they're going to go. Right. Like, uh, I, I think that's tough. I don't think there's an easy answer, but I'm not sure, that, you know, making it okay. Nobody can make a, a decision until after the Super Bowl. I think that that makes it even more messy and, and really, really hurts the teams that have moved on from their coach. So yeah. uh, I would love to see something. I just, I haven't seen, I haven't seen something that per- makes perfect sense to this point. Chris says, he'd like to suggest a rule change with the fifth year option. He said, this is what he's proposing. Every NFL team should have one fifth year option that they can choose to use per NFL draft class on any selection from that class. This could be used on any pick used in the draft and not limited to only first rounders. This would help with teams that hit on later round draft picks that are more worthy of coming back for a fifth season with a considerable pay raise. If a team does not, if a team does have more than one first round pick in the draft, they would have an additional fifth year option available per additional first round pick in the draft. What's preventing you from just signing a player to a contract extension? Like I don't, I don't, I don't get the the motivation to have a floating fifth year option that could be placed on somebody who's not a first round pick. Ability to maintain control. That's what that would be the reason, right? You can't sign anybody until after three seasons, anyways. But you lock them in for another one, right? Like it's just more control. Right, but why do you need to do that? Just sign the player to a new contract. Conversely, you could use the franchise tag if you wanted to. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly there's safeguards in place. There's no doubt about it. Because I think that gets hairy from a player contract perspective. Okay, I'm going to sign my rookie deal, but I might have a fifth year option. I might not have a fifth year option. I need to wait three years to find out if I'm I'm getting one. This isn't helpful for the players. I think it's the biggest thing, right? Like I don't yeah. think the players would want yeah, this. If you're I, I, if you're some fourth round pick that's been unbelievable, it's going to be a fixture for a football team. You want to get that full contract as soon as possible, as opposed to pushing it out. So I or, think if you're, or the alternative is if they want the your player control for one year fully guaranteed, give me the franchise tag and more money anyway. Just get, but sooner it happens sooner, which is better for you because that means your next contract happens sooner. Right. So if you're pro teams and controlling players, then you love this idea. If you want the players to have the most opportunity to maximize their earnings potential, I think you don't like this at all. Yeah. Okay. Next one is from Joe at work. Every time we hear from Joe at work, I have to say it's my favorite handle out there. It just reminds me of times when I was at work, just chilling on social media, uh, looking at football stuff when I was supposed to be working. So Joe at work says a double take here, and this is a journey. Take one is teams should not look at how the Packers drafted and developed Jordan Love and use it as a blanket model for developing a future starting quarterback. The number of stars that need to align are too great. You need an owner who doesn't panic. You need a GM with longevity, a coach who can develop quarterbacks over multiple years, and a quarterback who isn't going to be threatened. You need to be in the draft position to take a young quarterback. And oh, by the way, you need a good, talented quarterback to be available to draft. It's so rare for it all to work. Now, take two is that the LA Rams should look at how the Packers drafted and developed Jordan Love and use it as a model for developing a future starting quarterback. The Packers didn't have a quarterback that was not threatened by Jordan Love. Aaron Rodgers made it abundantly clear how ticked off he was with the presence of Jordan Love when they made the pick. And afterwards, every time he was asked about the drafting and usage of that asset. So I, I guess I disagree that like the conditions have to be a certain kind of way. I think there are certain organizations that could get away with something like this, and other ones could not. Do you trust the Arizona Cardinals to do this? No. Right. Do you trust the Chicago Bears to do this? No. Do you trust Pitts, the Pittsburgh Steelers to do something like this? Potentially. You know who the stable organizations are across the league and who the stable organizations are not. Is it that extremely different than what happened with Jalen Hurts other than Jalen Hurts fell into the 50s for Philadelphia? Yeah, so you're saying you agree with it, that they should not look at how the Packers drafted and developed Jordan Love as a blanket model for developing a future I think certain teams can. Right. But certain teams have no business thinking, having any kind of audacity that they would have a three year runway to use a first round pick on a quarterback to never play. 
yeah, I, I, circumstantially, I just don't know that it, it really works out anyways. Cause like you mentioned with Aaron Rodgers, the, the bottom line is, yeah, he was pissed off about it, but then he played at such a high level that it didn't matter, right? Like he, he was going to continue to have that opportunity. What quarterback is going to be able to respond like that in their, you know, in the twilight of their career? Nah, probably, probably just about zero. Right. So I think your best case scenario, if you want it, like if you're trying to pitch the patient path, I, I think you're looking at maybe one year incubation and that's about it. I don't think, I don't think it could be this long, but for the Rams, you digging we'll this? See, we'll see how Stafford holds up physically, but yeah, I think there's, they there's, should start there's thinking been, about it. A clear commitment from Les Snead to see, see this kind of thing through. The question is, are you going to get a toolsy talented passer that falls into your lap with, with where you're drafting to do this as a playoff team this year? Probably not. Yeah. But Les needs been through the highs and lows and has plenty of leash because they want a Super Bowl. So, like, yeah, I, th- I think that's the kind of executive and brain trust that that would have the runway to do something like this. I agree. All right, we got a few more to get to here, folks. So stick with us. But, folks, you got to check out Prize Picks. Prize Picks is the most fun, easiest, most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. The format is incredible. It's just you against the numbers. It's not you against thousands of other players including pros and sharks. It's just you against numbers. Here's what you do. You select two or more players. You pick more or less in their projected stats. You place your entry. That's it. It doesn't take long. You can make an entry in under a minute, and then when you win, the withdrawals are super, super quick. I also love with prize picks that you can you know, pick players and stat projections from different sports. So if there's something you like in basketball, hockey, football, put it all together to make that entry that you absolutely love. So go to prizepicks.com slash NFL. And use code locked on NFL for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars. Again, that's prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL and use code locked on NFL for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars. Prize picks daily fantasy sports made easy. Give me a take and I got something for you. Okay. Uh let this one. KST, bunch of numbers, long long okay. YouTube name. The Miami Dolphins should hire Leslie Frazier as defensive coordinator so they can marry the two-high shell with a more conventional defense that allows their players to play fast and help them have success against Buffalo. So, Joe, I'd like your perspective. I know I've obviously dove headfirst into the book of Fangio, and a lot of good that did me. Printed out that whole darn playbook for potentially one year, and that's it. Um, It's a lot of... Pattern match, zone match, heavy communication, passing things off, leveraging routes in real time simultaneously. How much overlap is there between that and what the Leslie Frazier style defense that you saw in Buffalo? Tons. Tons of that. So does it help you play faster? Or is it just kind of a continuation of what you committed to doing this past year anyway. Yeah, it's it's more of a continuation. I think once you're you get a bunch of guys that you trust in that back seven to play together and play with vision, right? And communicate, well then it becomes really, really good. Um, but it's you know, I, I think you need to have some really core players, several core players in your back seven that have that time on task together and in the scheme for it to really be what you intend for it to be. Well, and I, I I'm glad you said that because the uh the area where Miami was least frequent with having players playing together this season was the secondary. I think they had their, their best five for three games uh, in the middle of the season with Kansas city, Las Vegas, and um, the first New York jets game, I think was kind of it. And then Javon Holland has two MCL sprains against the jets and they never got the gang back together the rest of the way. That said also, uh, from what I've heard, all the players who were most glad to see Vic Fangio go were players in the secondary. Yeah. Who were really frustrated with how um, rigid Vic was at times uh, in your his his one year tenure with Miami. So I'm receptive to to the Leslie Frazier. I, I think he obviously his experience would be invaluable. The fact that he's familiar with uh, a divisional opponent that you've had a lot of difficulty with, I, I think is kind of a nice extra feather in his cap. I'll be fascinated to see if we end up getting like an interview list for Miami there. But what I want to do now, Joe, 
You and I at the beginning of the season, we made some wagers. Oh, we made boy. some bold bets around all 32 teams. And if you remember, we went through and we made, like, we accepted bets formally of like, I want to yeah. take you up on this one and I want to take you up on that one. Okay. And I want to go, I want to go through them with you. Okay. So we, okay. we bring this Friday episode to a close. So would you like to start on the AFC side of things or the NFC side of things? Kyle, open up the big old can of worms here, right here at the end. Um, that doesn't matter. Like AFC. Okay, so we're gonna do AFC. Would you like to do Kyle's bets that Joe took up, or Joe's bets that Kyle took up first? Let's do the ones that you took up first. So, so your bets that I took you up on. Yeah. Okay. Your first one in the AFC side. Stephon Diggs set the receiving touchdown record for the Buffalo Bills. Didn't happen. And that he was aiming for 11. Yeah. Um, number two is not much better for you. Uh, Zach Taylor total yards rushing uh, is the highest of his career with the Cincinnati Bengals from a NFL ranking perspective. So that would need to be from raw yards, 22nd or higher in the NFL. Did I get it? I'm guessing no. You did not. Get Where it. did they finish? All right, so let me I, – I just marked the wins and losses. I didn't oh. do it, so let me do Bengals reference 2023. Yeah. Uh, their rushing yards, uh, 1527 was 31st in the league. Oh, I killed it. Are you <laughs> kidding me? I saw the vision for sure. Crushed it. Good Lord. So okay. uh, so they, they were bold bets for a reason. Uh, your next one also in the AFC North, uh, Miles Garrett – 17 plus sacks this season. oh he, he went on a slump didn't he? he finished with 14 yeah he went like five or six games in a row with none okay uh Doing i great, tried man. to take you up on the derrick henry trade and you vetoed that one that was a good choice so that was a good veto for you yeah uh your next one was in relation to the los angeles chargers do you remember what the bet was uh no clue uh, that the chargers would finish as the top scoring offense in the history of their franchise with oh boy they needed to clear 483 points. And what'd they get? Uh, 346. So they were only off by about 140. Points. Jesus, Kyle. This, I'm getting, this is a roast. This is a roast is what this is. <laughs> but you nailed the last one. Josh okay. Daniels out by week 18. Hell I yeah. I knew I could it. count on something. He didn't there. even make it to November. So Yeah, I crushed it. <laughs> now, mine on the AFC side of things. Good God. I hope I this 1,500 is bad yards you. incoming for Garrett Wilson. Yeah. Didn't have got 1,000. I was kind of banking on Aaron Rodgers to you help know, him out a little bit. You know, I was and counting I on got, Joe Burrow and Justin Herbert to be healthy. We got, I think <laughs> we got four snaps out of Mr. Rodgers in his neighborhood. So that didn't happen. Uh, my next one, though, uh, was uh, a happy ending. I said Jalen Warren, 1,000 yards from scrimmage for the Pittsburgh Steelers. I know they combined for like 1,800 rushing yards. It's probably worked out for you. Warren got 1,154 yards from scrimmage this season. Nicely done. Uh, 61 receptions for 370. They had 2,000 yard backs from scrimmage. Yes. Wow. Uh, shame on me. Uh, my next one was in the AFC North. I had the Cleveland Browns with Elijah Moore finishing as the team's leading receiver. Amari Cooper took great offense. Was he Did second? That? Did Njoku finish second? Uh, so Njoku had the most receptions on the team. Cooper had the most yards on the team, and they were flip flop for Cooper was second in receptions, okay, and Njoku was second in yards, and Elijah Moore was third in both. So that did not happen. Uh, I had Greg Dulcich as the leading receiver for the Denver Broncos. <laughs> Pour one out. Pour one out. Uh, I veto Josh Jacobs being the only player with over 100 yards rushing for the season. That actually happened for the Raiders last year. And uh, J the Jacobs injury kind of betrayed me because Amir White ended up doing really well. He finished with 451 rushing yards, but that was the only other player to go over. So if all that volume would have gone to Josh Jacobs like it did the year prior, then that would have been a good bet. But I vetoed it anyway. Uh, so just to highlight why that bet was a thing, uh, Josh Jacobs, 340 carries in 2022. The next highest for a back was 17. Zemir White got over 100 this year. So The replication of that year over year is tough, right? Just yes. Uh, and then my last one 
is to be determined. It's Austin Eckler and Keenan Allen's last ride with the Chargers. And you took me up on that. I feel good about Eckler. Allen might be tough. Yeah. I mean, he is one of those candidates to potentially move on from and and clear up some long-term flexibility. And he's somebody you could maybe have a trade market for. So we'll see. So that didn't look too good for the people that made the bets. So we each got one right in the AFC. Okay. Like the bold better. Okay. So we're at 0-0 going into the NFC here? Yes, that's correct. There's no net positive? Uh, Micah Parsons, I'll do, I'll do mine first that you took me up on. Okay. And this got ugly. Uh, <laughs> Micah Parsons breaks the sack record. Did not happen. Yeah. And those linebacker injuries didn't help me out either. So another good bet for Joe to take me up on. A Washington Commanders, two 1,000-yard receivers. Oh, man, Dotson just didn't have it this year, yeah, right? He had nothing. And all that volume for throwing the ball in Washington, too, like the right. process I thought was pretty good. We just didn't get the results. They finished um, first in the league of pass attempts, 636 <laughs> pass attempts. Oh, God. What did they finish in yards? Uh, yardage was 18th. Not a good spot to be. Well, Not you know, a... Sam Howe gets sacked 18,000 times. Not good. Uh, Terry McLaurin, 1,002. Jahan Dotson, 518. Uh, Curtis Samuel, 613. Yeah. Kind of really revived himself. Contract year Curtis Samuel. Cur- contract year Curtis Samuel. You tried to take me up on Fields doubles his career passing yards in one season. I vetoed that. It's a good veto. Yeah. Didn't good happen. Veto. Good Didn't veto. Happen. JSN tops either Tyler Lockett or DK Metcalf in receiving production. That did not happen thanks to a slow start. So you you got me there. But yeah. does Puka Nakua wide receiver two count? Yeah, you, yeah, even though he it. was wide receiver one. Yeah, you got you got it. Okay, got it. so that, that was the, the I got a bull bet on each side. So I, I I took I took that one and you got it. I got it. Yeah. So I got two total for my bold bets that okay. you took me up on on the side. Okay. Okay. Uh. Joe, your first NFC one that I took you up on was the Minnesota Vikings. Yeah, I had a, I was close. I, this was not bad. <laughs> you this were really bad. close. Less than 13 wins, positive point differential. So they had half of the wins that they did last year. I could year. have never right. imagined the quarterback carousel. They were minus 18 Gosh, in man. point differential, and they lost their last four games. Good and Lord. They, and they lost their last four games by three points, six points, 23 points, and 10 points. I was close. Just the Green Bay game alone right. in week 17 cost you this bet. I'm okay with it. Uh, Miles Sanders. Oh, no. Remember what your Miles yeah, 50, 50 catches? <laughs> they yeah, said Frank turd. Wright coming out <laughs> talking Freaking. about we want to feed you the ball. He even uh, said he wanted 50 catches. So that was part of like a sound bit that came out over the summer. He got halfway there. He got 27 this season. So, Miles Sanders, that uh, – that contract's not looking great for Carolina. I don't know that they can get out of it this year without no. a bunch of dead cap either. I might do it, though. Uh, you had the Saints winning the South by at least one game, clearing in the standings. Did not happen. And I know both of us were particularly low on Tampa Bay. So, did they finish with the league's worst rushing offense again? Tampa? Yeah. It, well, there's one spot below Cincinnati, so... They were rushing 3.4 yards per carry and 1509 yards. So that was that. So you didn't take me up on that one, but I did get that one as a bet. Bold prediction for, for Tampa. Bay. Saw the path. Saw the path. The path was here. <laughs> uh, and then the last one in the NFC that you had was the LA Rams would be bottom five in sacks as a team. Okay. How do we do? Kobe Turner. Oh, who would have saw it coming? Mid-round pick to get coming in right. with like near 10 sacks. Right. So from doing? a sacks perspective, where is it at? Uh, let's see. The Rams finished with 41 sacks. The teams that were worse than the Rams with sacks this season were the Carolina Panthers with 27. Oh, God. 27. 27. The Chicago Bears with 30. 
thank God we traded for Montez Sweater. We might have yeah. had 10. Oh, yeah, right, right. The Arizona Cardinals with 33. The Giants and Saints each had 34. Oh, so there's so your that, bottom five. Okay. You also had the New England Patriots with 36. The Andrews. Washington Commanders with 39. And they Straight traded all their bad players. pressures at the trade deadline. And the Jacksonville Jaguars with oh. four. So the Good Rams Lord. finished ninth. Ninth and lower. didn't Jacksonville get? They had two double digit t- sack guys. Jacksonville, yeah. Walker and and Allen both got it right. Did Walker get double digit? Yeah, I'm pretty I know sure he did. He did. Yeah, ref- yeah. Pro Football Reference has him at ten and Josh Allen at seventeen and a half. Ray Robertson Harris the next highest with three and a half. Caleb on Chase on and Foye Olakun the only two that got more than one. So so two double digit sack guys, including one with seventeen, and you're. In the bottom, bottom 10? Bottom, bottom eight. eight. <laughs> you're, you're eighth worst in the NFL. Okay. Games. Okay. <laughs> so uh, of the bold predictions, we obviously have more bold predictions that we made, but those are the ones that each one of us felt really compelled to like take each other up on. And uh, we collectively won three of the bets we took up on each other. So what does that mean? Does, is there? No, it's, I mean, we could run it. You won the pick them. So, I mean, there's, there's not like there's, a big lead that somebody's like, oh, I dominated this year's stuff. It was close, right? Yeah. Really close. I won the pick them by like a game. And a if game. We're, we're, I'm still only a game up. And yeah. it, it could be tied going into the Super Bowl if the oh, Lions Oh, Lord. Don't and win. then we'll just have to, we'd have to pick different on principle if that's the case. Well, it's going to be tough to not pick the AFC team regardless. I'll be honest with Correct. you. Correct. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I could see San Francisco. I could see myself talking into San Francisco if they played Kansas City, but I don't know that I would. Oh, really? If Baltimore, if Baltimore advances, I, I think I'd pick Baltimore no matter what. Yeah, I'm picking the AFC yeah. team. Baltimore beat Detroit by 32 points this season already. Yeah, I'm picking the AFC yeah. team for sure. <laughs> for sure. For sure. So that um, – it's kind of a walkthrough at the beginning of the year, our, our bull bets that we took each other up on, which is kind of a nice rewind as we, we get ready for our last weekend of multiple games before the Super Bowl. We got a lot of great stuff coming, so we hope you guys will uh, take that journey with us. Uh, I'm Kyle Krabs. He's Joe Marino. You can find us on YouTube or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. Make it a great rest of your day. But we are out of here. We'll talk to you again on Monday.